So the subject of today's lecture is Minkowski space. Although we may not get to the point of defining it, we will, however, define special relativity. Okay, so for those of you with a physics interest already, I don't need to convince you this is interesting. Um, I mean, I think relativity should be interesting for everyone, but let's suppose, for example, that you don't a priori have any particular interest in physics. Nonetheless, I think it's the case that a mathematician really has no choice but to grapple with relativity at some point. I don't think it's optional to have struggled with it, simply because, okay, if you have an interest, say, in topology or geometry as a mathematician, uh, well, you want to use these words like space and time, right? And you want to have them have the deepest possible meaning, and you want to really be serious about using those words. So then if the experimentalists come along and tell you that your most basic intuitions about space and time are just wrong, it seems like you should pay at least a little bit of attention, right? Okay, so let's do that. <laughs> Okay, so before I get into relativity though, let's briefly recall what we did last time because it's relevant. So we're talking about metric spaces and we took a different point of view on metrics last lecture, which was starting with a positive definite symmetric matrix P. Uh, we could define this bilinear pairing. So that's a function of a pair of vectors in Rn, which is linear in both variables. Uh, and it gave rise to a metric on Rn. Uh, but it wasn't that exciting, really, because in the end we figured out that all the metric spaces we get in this way are isometric to the ones where we just take D or P to be a diagonal matrix with positive numbers on the diagonal. Okay, so that is a new example, but okay, we didn't maybe get as many new examples out of this as we might have expected. Uh, okay, but this does latch naturally lead us to a question, which is... Um, Okay, we might not get a metric out of a P, which is, suppose I just make one of these negative, right? Okay, so take a diagonal matrix. Don't allow any of the entries to be zero. That would be really not interesting. Uh, but suppose that some of the entries are positive and some of the other ones are negative. We can still write down this bilinear pairing. It doesn't give rise to a metric anymore. But we have a vector space together with a uh, bilinear pairing, which is what we call non-degenerate. Well, does that structure have any geometric or physical significance? Okay, that's sort of a natural question. Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> That's uh, relativity, so that's what we'll discuss today. Um, okay. So, I mean, maybe one way to summarize the point of today's lecture is the, the following slogan. space, that is like the stuff between my hands, is not a metric space. That is, the appropriate mathematical structure for talking about space is not a metric space. In the precise sense I discussed it in the first lecture, if I have two observers trying to talk about what's going on in space and they use as the appropriate abstraction a metric space, they will get totally confused. They'll communicate garbage. This is not obvious. This is a totally non-intuitive fact uh, of physical reality, but nonetheless it is a fact. Okay, so if, I mean, it doesn't matter if you include time into R3 to make R4 and talk about that as a metric space, it's still wrong. Okay, so if a metric space is not the appropriate abstraction to talk about what happens in space and time, well, what is? Okay, so that question is what's going to motivate the following discussion of abstractions which are not covered by the notion of metric space, like topological space, um, non-degenerate bilinear forms, quadratic spaces, and 
uh, various other things. So we've got to deal with this fact somehow. This is what relativity says, as I'll explain. Uh, in the way we've set up the discussion of abstractions of space, uh, The idea of going beyond metric spaces, whatever that means. Well, I've discussed that every sort of abstraction of what a space is is associated with a symmetry group, right? That's a very deep idea. So if we want to go beyond metric spaces, and here we sort of know what the symmetry group, appropriate symmetry groups are, we need to go beyond The isometry groups, uh, well, let's not say beyond isometries, maybe. Let's say beyond the isometries of Rn with D2 as the metric. Well, we've only discussed a sort of subgroup of this as an exercise in this lecture, which gets you to explore the full group, right? So people either write En for that or ISO N sometimes, particularly if you're a physicist. So that's a group of isometries. It contains rotations, reflections, and also translations, right? A translation clearly preserves the D2 distance between points, and that's it. So if you take the group generated by those three classes of symmetries, you get this entire group. Okay, so if we're going to talk about something beyond metric spaces, it means in particular, um, we must be introducing some new kind of symmetry which does not fall into the group generated by those basic symmetries. So that's another way to think about it. All right. So some of you asked me in the first lecture, uh, well, what about two observers that are moving relative to one another? Right? We discussed observers that were fixed in space. Uh, so that's what we're now going to discuss. We're going to do everything in the plane again, so we're going to add time to observers in the plane. Of course, you can add a third dimension. It doesn't really change anything I'm going to do, so it's not really a restriction that we're only talking about two dimensions of space. Uh, naturally, of course, you know, for actual relativity, you want uh, three dimensions of space. Okay, so let's consider two observers in the plane. Again, uh, O1 and O2. where O2 is moving relative to O1. With some constant velocity, uh, let's say, R. OK, that is O1 measures O2 as a point to be moving with some constant velocity. R, R could be 0. All right. Okay, so let's just write out as clearly as we can the default expectation of how this should work given our intuitions about space, right? So if I have two observers moving relative to one another and I ask them to measure points in the plane, remember X stands for the plane without a pre-existing coordinate system, so that's sort of like the real reality. Uh, and they measure points, there's observer 2's measurements, there's observer 1's measurements, and we can convert between them, uh, in this case, by a translation. Okay, so the translation symmetry of the plane, let me write it as Tx. So Tx adds x to an input y. That's not a linear transformation, right? But it's still an isometry of the plane. I mean, it's affine. Uh, we have a commutative diagram at time t where that equals that. Okay, so what's the idea here? The idea here, well, uh, so assuming 
the observers are co-located at time t equals zero. And let me just say same axes and spell out what that means verbally. So I just mean that the axes aren't rotated to one another and they have the same orientation. So they're really just using the same x-axis and the same y-axis at time equals zero. Okay, so at time equals zero, they're both sitting there, both, both measuring points the same way. Uh, at some later time, the second observer has moved, well, a distance t times r. We assume that the relative angle hasn't changed and the orientation hasn't changed. Okay, so if there's a point x, then the measurement O1 gives to that point must just be the measurement given by O2 plus TR. That's what that says. Right? So M2 x plus TR equals M1 x. Okay, so this holds for all times t. So what I now want to do is just incorporate the time into the setup. So instead of having sort of at different times we measure, we're just going to consider the idea of tagging our measurements of the plane with a time, and we call those pairs events. Right? So we're just going to rephrase this situation. Okay, so an event. Well, yeah, it's sort of a bit tricky. Okay, I should flag right now that, as in the discussion in the first lecture, this business with x is a little vague, right? This is not meant to be a very precise notion. x, the plane without coordinates. But that didn't matter because at some point we eliminated this entirely and we were just talking about symmetries of R2, right? And that was completely rigorous and there was nothing to do with some abstract plane or things out there in reality. Well, it's the same now. I'm going to introduce the idea of events, which won't be sort of precise. That's meant to stand for physical reality somehow in which the observers are embedded. Uh, that's not meant to be sort of precise mathematics completely. It's okay because we'll then very quickly eliminate it and just be talking about functions from Rn to Rn. All right? So that's how this is going to work. But we, we use this to sort of get a handle on what we're trying to say. Okay, so instead of x, we now consider a set E of events. And the observers measure events by a measurement x of location and t of time. Right? So now m1 and m2 no longer go from x to r2, but they go from e such pairs. Right? So you would think of an event E, so something happened, each observer writes down the time according to their clock and the position according to their rulers, and that's their measurement of the event. And as before, we can assume, I mean, we assume these are bijections, right? so that everything is measurable and distinct things have distinct measurements. Okay. Okay, so just rephrasing this, our naive expectation would be that the way to convert M2's measurements to sorry, O2's measurements to O1's, given this situation, uh, is that, okay, so 
Observer 2 says the time is t and says the position is, uh, what am I saying there, y? Well, let's say x. Then O1 will write down the same time and, well, they'll write down that plus t times r. Okay, so if they're in constant relative motion, then that's what we would naively expect the uh, conversion between their measurements to be. Okay, any questions so far? All right. Okay, so before I say that's not true, um, Let's just observe some things that the observers agree about. This is also how I set up the first lecture, right? We set up this idea, and then we talked about the quantities measurable in the plane that the two observers would agree on. Okay, so let's observe that the observers agree about um, which sets of events represent linear motion. Right? There's something out there, something's moving, uh, they make a bunch of observations, and they agree about which sequences of observations represent linear motion. let's say, according to observer 2. So how do they tell, right? They've got some bunch of events. It's just a set. They observe everything in that set of events, and then what they get out should look like, you know, at time t, there's a linear function of t, right? That's what they should see if they are, well, let's say, finite linear motion. Okay, so if there exists, an alpha less than beta, that's the time interval over which they're seeing it, and there should be an initial point of the motion and a direction of the motion such that when I apply M2 to this set of events, right, so that is the set of all things of the form M2E, where E belongs to A, so that's then a subset of R3. And it must be a subset of R3, which can be described as T x0 plus Tu. Right? That's what linear motion looks like. Okay, so we'd call, I mean, observer 2 would naturally call the vector u, the velocity of the motion, and the norm of u in the usual sense, the speed. Okay, so, well, the point of this headline is that, well, what would observer 1 measure according to this idea that that diagram commutes? Well, they would measure m1 of a, which is f12 of m2 of a, which is just the result of applying f12 to everything inside that bracket. But given the formula for F12, it's just T, and then I just add TR to whatever I find, right? So that'll be X0 plus T times R times T times U. All right, so this is just an unnecessarily complicated way of saying that if the observer 2 thinks the velocity is u, then observer 1 thinks the velocity is r plus u. Right. So I haven't really said uh, much yet. Okay, so that's observation 1. So if observer 2 sees a linear motion, observer 1 will also see a linear motion. They'll disagree about the speed and the velocity, but they will agree on the time right, that it started and the time that it ended. Uh, and they agree, of course, that it's linear motion. <coughs> 
Okay, there's some subtleties to setting up special relativity, and what I'm about to say is connected to perhaps the primary one, which is not only do the observers agree on which motions are linear, but they agree on the event which represents halfway through the motion. Right? I mean, that's sort of tautological because they agree on the time interval, so they obviously they agree on halfway along the time interval. Right? This will become highly non-obvious once we switch to relativity. Right? This will be one of the postulates. Okay, so I'm going to observe it's true in this case, and then we'll take it as a postulate in a minute. Okay, so the observers agree on, let's call it the midpoint decomposition. Okay, so what I just wrote down is the way that observer 2 would divide those events into the first half and the second half of the linear motion, right? There's just some events out there, observer 2 measures them all, and then they say, okay, well, I measured the time of this collection of events to be less than or equal to the halfway point, and these other events to be greater than or equal to, and that's how I would divide up that collection of events according to my measurements. And, well, certainly, observer 1 would also decompose that set of events in the same way, right? So by midpoint decomposition, I mean expressing A as a union of two subsets which intersect in precisely one element. That's the midpoint, right? The midpoint being the M2 of E. Well, the E where M2 of E has first component. So this one, M2 of E is a tuple, right? It's, got, it's in R3. The first coordinate is the time. And I've got the inequality on the time. So the midpoint is just the event which is at time a half A plus, sorry, alpha plus beta. Okay, so the point is that when you actually go out and make two observers move, uh, F12 is wrong. You get them to write down their measurements, then they come back to the same place and they compare what they wrote down. This will not correctly give you observer 1's measurements given observer 2's measurements. That's just a remarkable empirical fact. Of course, it's a fascinating story, uh, but this is in a physics class, so it's not the place to discuss the experiments which show this is true. All right, then, what do we do? We just give up? Uh, well, no. I mean, there is some function f12, right? Because m1 and m2 are both bijections, so I can just go backwards along m2 and then along m1. That's some function which converts between the two measurements. That's kind of a dumb way of describing it, right? Because that's just saying you just write down all measurements and then you just match them up. So can we figure out a formula for F12 which converts the measurements? Well, we deduce such a formula from a set of hypotheses called the postulates of special relativity. Okay, so the situation is we, you know, this is what we thought was going to happen. You go out and do the experiment. It doesn't work. Well, so something is wrong, right? One of your hypotheses is wrong. Well, which one? Well, then you have to do the difficult process of figuring out you know, what to hold on to and what to let go of in order to actually get to a correct answer. So it turns out that the two things you should hold on to are, well, you should keep the idea that observers agree on which set of events are linear motion. And you should keep the idea that they agree on the midpoint decomposition. Uh, but you have to let go of the idea that they agree on the time. Okay. So let me write down exactly what we keep. I mean, this is 
Okay, so the, the hypothesis is that there exists some number, C, such that for any pair of observers, uh, whose relative motion is constant and linear. So that sets up an equivalence class of observers, which are called inertial reference frames. So the word inertial just means the, constant, the relative motion is constant and linear. OK, so given a pair of observers with that kind of relationship, the first hypothesis is that the observers agree on which sets of events represent constant linear motion, let's say. All right, so more, more precisely, okay, so the observers still are attached, the, the word observer is attached to a bijection from E to R3. And then that means that they can both, given a subset, attach to it a set of points in R3. And they will say the same sets are of that form for some alpha, beta, x0, and u. Okay. So they agree on which sets of events represent linear motion. Okay, so given... I'm going to be a little less precise in what I write on the board as to what's in the notes, just to save time. But, um, so given a set of events which represents a linear motion, and they both agree on that by hypothesis. All right, so given a linear motion in that sense, the observers agree on the midpoint decomposition. That is, they agree what halfway through the motion means. That concept is invariant between the two observers. So what does that mean? Well, each observer comes with an M1 and M2. To write down this decomposition, I just needed to use the function, right? So M1, put M1 in there, you get a decomposition of A. Put M2 in there, you get a decomposition of A. And they must be the same decomposition. And, okay, well, that was true before. This is the thing that's new, right? Uh, okay, so take a subset of E. Suppose it represents a linear motion, then they both agree it's a linear motion, right? Well, any linear motion... So the observe, both observers write down something that looks like this. Or maybe I should stress. Right? They both think it's a linear motion, but they may disagree about when it started and when it ended according to their clocks. They may disagree about where it start, where the position where it started, and they may disagree about how fast it is. Right. The only thing they agree on is that it's a linear motion. Everything else is up for grabs. Right. Okay, so in particular they disagree on the speed, potentially. Right. But now is where the C comes in. So the observers agree which linear motions have speed C. Right. Every observer attaches to every linear motion some speed. If one observer attaches this special speed C to the linear motion, so does the other observer. Okay, so that's it. All right. So, of course, C is the speed of light. Okay, so as I said, I mean, this is maybe a little... Uh, I mean, what we want to do now is translate all of this into a discussion about just functions from R3 to R3. Uh, because at the moment it's involving E, right? Uh, 
So what we now want to do is just phrase um, Okay, so what do these hypotheses mean for the class of functions which converts between the measurements of the two observers? Right. So which functions f have the property that if you use them to convert the measurements of the observers, it would have this conversion would lead to them agreeing on all of these things. All right. So let's make that definition. Okay, so I just want some notation to write down the next definition. So given alpha and beta and x0 and u, let the line uh, given by that formula be denoted by L alpha beta x0 u. So that's just T x0 plus T u alpha less than T less than beta. Uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, that was meant to be R2, yeah. Did I write R3 in the... Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. That should be an R2 in the notes. I'll try and fix that. Yeah, so the things with underlines, well, later there'll be points in R3 as well. But okay, so this means points in the plane. All right, so definition. A function, so this is our candidate conversion between the coordinate systems. So it takes a time and a point in the plane, turns it into another time in the point and a point in the plane. Let's call it a special relativity conversion. Okay, this is a totally made up term. Don't go using that outside of this class. <laughs> um, I mean, later we'll be fancy and call these Poincaré group elements, right? But this is just for the moment. They're called SR conversions. If, well, first of all, the conversion between the coordinate systems, it makes sense to assume it's continuous, right? in the usual sense of a function of three variables being continuous. Okay, so what I want to do is translate these physical hypotheses into precise mathematical statements. Right? Okay, so F preserves line segments. All right, so for all alpha less than or equal to beta and X zero and U in R3. There exist alpha prime less than or equal to beta prime and x0 u okay so if observer 2 observes a line then observer 1 should observe some other line so that is f of the line alpha beta x0 u should be the line alpha prime, beta prime, x0 prime, u prime. Okay, so that was just a way of writing down formally what SR1 says. Oh dear, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Is that the only occurrences? I think that's right now, yeah. Uh, I should say, I mean, alpha and beta are real numbers, right? Those are times. Okay. So now there's nothing, nothing vague about that. That's a precisely given statement. Uh, SR2 says that the observers agree on the midpoint decomposition. Um, well, we can encode that precisely by saying that given any pair of positions and times, right? You can imagine the linear motion between them, the midpoint of that, if you feed that into the conversion function. So the midpoint of that would be maybe what observer two thinks is the midpoint of the motion. So that would be Tx plus T prime X prime divided by two. And that needs to become the midpoint according to observer one. So we would need this to be equal to f of tx plus f of t prime x prime divided by 2. Okay, so that says 
what SR2 says. Uh, and third, here I'm being a bit tricky. <laughs> uh, it's actually a difficult point I'm skipping. Uh, I'll say a bit about that in a second. So. Okay, so given two, I mean, these are two measurements of events, right? Two times and two places. Well, let me write S, Y for the result of applying F to T, X, and S prime, Y prime for the result of applying F to T prime, X prime. It's just notation. Then, I want the observers to both calculate the same quantity when they take minus c squared t prime minus t squared plus x prime minus x squared. Right, this is just using observer 2's measurements, some quantity. This is just the usual length in R2. That should be the same as minus c squared s prime minus s squared plus y prime minus y. OK, it is not obvious that that is the same thing as SR3. OK, there is a special case which is obviously the same thing as SR3. Uh, this is a bit stronger than SR3, and that's the aforementioned sneaky business. Um, but let me explain why that is stronger than SR3. And let me do that by stating an SR3 double prime. OK, uh, first I should say that's it. Well, what have I said? Definition, a function is an SR conversion if blah, blah, blah. Uh, I also need one more condition before I explain. OK, what does that say? Well, what's zero comma zero? Yeah. Is that enough? So the thing going into F is supposed to be observer two's measurements. What do they measure as zero comma zero? Himself, right? At time zero. But I assume that observer two and observer one were sitting at the same place at time zero and had the same coordinate system. So if I take zero zero and feed in F, that is convert to observer one's measurements, I better get zero zero again. Okay, so that's being encoded by that. Um, okay, we also need to feed in the symmetry of the situation somehow, namely that well, none of these hypotheses have encoded the physical sort of idea that the observers are in constant relative motion. Right? So F10 is what observer 2 measures, I mean they measure themselves, their own position at time one. And then I need to convert that to observer one's measurements. So this is what observer one measures, where observer one measures observer two to be at some time. We don't know that it's the same time because we're not assuming that their clocks are the same, right? But at least the position part better be uh, something to do with where observer two is according to observer one. This says that it's symmetrical, right? That observer two measures observer one to be moving away at the negative velocity. That's the content of that. Uh, this will sort of become a bit clearer later, but this is encoding something. We didn't have to state that in the physical hypotheses because it was sort of implicit, but we need to get it implicit, explicitly into the mathematics. All right, so at the moment, I hope everything except for why this is the same as SR3 uh, should be clear. Okay, so let me now explain the connection between that formula and the postulate SR3. And I'll do it by stating a slightly modified form. <coughs> 
So that is meant to be a statement in the same situation. I've got Tx and T prime x prime. Sy and S prime y prime are the images under F. Okay, so what does this first, what does this say? It says I had two points in the plane and the distance between them could be covered at speed c in time t prime minus t, according to my clock. Right? My clock meaning, well, this is talking about the stuff that goes into f, so that's observer 2. Right? So observer 2 says, I could cover the distance, I mean, if you move at speed c, whatever c is, uh, that distance, it took that time. Well, that's what SR3 is talking about, right? It's talking about a linear motion of speed c. So observer 2 sees a linear motion of speed c, then observer 1 must also see a linear motion of speed c. Okay? So this is the special case of this where they're both zero. All right, so this is stronger than that. Uh, I'm stating it this way because it's sort of easier to prove the connection to uh, matrices and these brackets the sort of the bracket with a subscript P when I'm taking this as my hypothesis and we'll come back and discuss it's so these two uh, are equivalent but the equivalence is actually not so I mean, there's a little bit of a trick involved okay so that's an SR conversion so let me now state the theorem Okay, so we've taken the postulates, right? I should have said, I, mean, I haven't mentioned the word Einstein anywhere, right? Of course, these are Einstein's postulates, right? Uh, okay, so we took those postulates, we formalized them as a statement about a continuous function. And now let me prove something about that class of functions. Okay, there's our matrix. This is exactly the kind of matrix we were wondering about at the beginning, right? Diagonal, one of the entries is negative. Okay, and I'm going to take the associated bilinear pairing to that matrix. Okay, so now V and W stand for points in R3. Right, so V, think of V as being, for instance, T comma X. So I claim a function f is an SR conversion if and only if first of all f is a bijection and well, first f is linear I mean, I didn't assume f was linear, but you can sort of believe that, right? If something preserves lines and preserves the origin, well, it better basically be linear. There's still a little bit of a trick involved because I didn't say it preserved parameterized lines in the sense that it sent the parameterization to a linear version of that parameterization. It just preserves lines as a set, okay? But together with the midpoint criterion, we'll be able to figure out that f is linear. Secondly, F preserves this pairing. And, well, I add three over here. Three is just translating SR4 there just directly, right? So, the first statement is clear because it's linear, and then I just add this. Okay, so that's the claim. Uh, once we prove that, then we've gotten ourselves back into a situation like what we've been discussing, right? The relevant symmetries for this kind of geometry of special relativity is a group. It's a group of transformations which preserve a certain pairing. That pairing is called the Minkowski uh, pairing, let's say. <laughs>
Okay. So that's not a metric, right? If I take V and pair it with itself, which is what I'd do to define a metric if P was positive definite, well, I get a negative sign. So let's just Okay, so what do I get if I pair a V with itself? Uh, well, I get V transpose times minus C squared 1, 1, V, which is minus C squared T squared plus the norm of the X part, right? And that can certainly be negative. Just take X to be 0 and the time to be anything you like. Okay, so this is certainly not a metric but it is nonetheless the appropriate mathematical structure uh, for special relativity. Um, okay, so we're gonna have to leave the proof till next time. Uh, so what we'll do is first, I mean, one direction is easy, assuming those axioms, getting SR1 prime through SR4 prime is easy. The hard part is starting from this and proving one, two, and three. Uh, and then after that, we'll go back and sort of tidy up this issue potentially of using really the thing we stated as SR3 rather than this stronger thing.